And real quick, I, I kind of skipped a section. The first publication of the Swiss Breeds, and it's still the basis for most later writings, he wrote, Hein wrote this on the occasion of the National Exhibition of Switzerland in 1914, which is presented, which was presented every 25 years in a big event for the Swiss country. It was a little pamphlet called Die Schweizer Sendung. And uh, the aim of this booklet was to convince Swiss dog lovers to part with the imported foreign dogs and to acquire and support their native breeds. Um, modern dog science has proved that some of Heim's views and ideas were wrong or exaggerated. And uh, he believed and proclaimed that the Swiss breeds as such were very old and that they were almost extinct. But you know, we admire his enthusiasm for trying to establish a new breed and his dedication for dogs in general, especially for those doing a job and for the farm dogs in his home. And this is where I'm going to stop and show you guys something. This is kind of cool. Um, I brought part of my collection with me today. And one of the things I love to brag about in my classes is that I happen to own this original pamphlet um, that was published called the Schweitzer Center. It's right here. So there's only five of them known to exist right now in the world. Um, there may be some in private collections, but there's only about five of them known to exist. Um, all my stuff is stored archivally, by the way. But uh, I felt pretty darn special for owning this. And my dear friend Margaret Barchi over in Switzerland happens to own one too. Well, hers has Dr. Heim's signature in it. <laughs> Can't have everything, can you? But at least I own one of them. Um, so now we're going to talk about Isaac Schleiss. Isaac Schleiss was a Kansas farmer. And he lived in Florence, Kansas, and he imported two Swiss registry dogs in 1926, a female and a male, um, Bernie's mountain dogs. And he tried to register this pair with the AKC, and he tried over and over again. He was quite persistent. Um, even the efforts of the Swiss book registrar, when they stepped in to help him, were quite unsuccessful. A mating of these two dogs, and this is not a painting of them, by the way, a mating of these two dogs produced a litter of five, which were whelped on March 29, 1926. And although the litter was born in the U.S., they still could not be registered with the Swiss Club. This is the first recorded instance of burners in the U.S. Notice that I had to uh, enunciate on the word recorded a little bit. In history, we know many times that people did things, that dogs were here before certain times, but we can't really say they were unless it's recorded. So this is the first time that we actually have it recorded that we have Bernie's Mountain Dogs on Swiss soil. I also own this publication that uh, I've never seen it before. I can't find it anywhere else. No one knows about it. Margaret Barchi doesn't even know that it exists. So that's, that's uh, I guess, what she gets for having the original Albert Heim signature. But this is Der Zuckum. And uh, in this book, Dr. Heim basically, it's not about Bernie's Mountain Dogs so much. It's about drafting with your dog. And one of the funny things about this book is that, and I have scans of all the pages of it if anybody wants to see them sometime. Um, one of the interesting things about it is he even tells you how to construct a harness for a moose to cart for you. So it's kind of funny, you know. But in this book, we also have Seeger Leo, who is in Bernagard, by the way. He's in the Bernagard database. And uh, here it shows him with a bunch of children pulling a Swiss cart. And uh, he's actually. Uh, there's some different pictures in the Bernard database of him that you'll see. Um, but in this, uh, in this publication, I was pleading for the further use of dogs as drop dogs. He says, you must give your dogs some work to do to keep them healthy and happy. And he wrote against animal protection activists and certain authorities who, who forbade using the, uh, the dogs for drop work. And like I said, he also gives evidence for how harnesses should be constructed. So that was 1930. Now, in the US, we had the AKC Gazette, um, which we still have. And in that publication was, in June of 1935, an article published by Mrs. A. Leach. And that article was called, The Bernese is a Loyal Dog of the Swiss Alps. Now, talk about marketing. This woman writes such a glowing article about the breed that probably everyone who would read it even today would want to rush out and get one. Um, she gives a brief history of the breed, and she talks about how she has resided in Switzerland for more than 30 years. The article mentions that when Abe Leach first saw the BMD in harness and pulling a cart, she gave bitter reproaches to the owner. Later, she mentions that she has since learned so much about the drought dogs, and she's fully convinced that they are much happier at work than when idle. 
She says that Abinam is passionately fond of children, and that even as she is writing, she's looking out the window and she can see a neighbor's BMD is pulling children along the road in a sled. He has no harness but instead a rope and is rushing up and down the road barking for all he is worth. Another dog is rolling in the snow with the neighbor's children. Aglich also mentions that during World War I, the BMDs were trained by the Red Cross in Germany and that they proved their ability for such work with splendid results. So they also pulled some artil artillery in Germany. And uh, I think in this presentation, I have a picture of Bernie's Mountain Dogs on a warship in World War II that I'll show you later. She talks about mention in the English press, press a few years prior, but the English quarantine law, which was going on at the time, has spoiled all efforts to have BMDs imported to England. And since the quarantine camels are very expensive, no one wastes, wants to take the plunge with a new breed. Back then there were some illnesses going on amongst dogs, so all dogs going to the UK were actually quarantined. And of course, if there's a new breed being introduced, you don't want to introduce this new breed when you're not even sure if people are going to accept it to begin with. So you don't want to spend the necessary money to do that. But overall, this was an extremely positive account of the Bernese Mountain Dog breed in general. And this is Bernie von Hasdenbach. June 1935, Glenn Shadow of Ruston, Louisiana, saw this article in the AKZ Gazette that I had just spoken of. He's just so enthralled with this article that he reads it two to three more times. He remembers the dogs that he saw in his first grade reader as a child. While in France in 1918 and 1919, he saw Berners for the first time in person, and his childhood fancy was rekindled. Financial circumstances at the time did not permit him to buy or import the dogs. After reading the article in the AKC Gazette, he wrote to Mrs. A. Leach and asked her to, for further information and to help him with making a purchase. So she helped him to buy on August 10, 1936, Freddy von Haslenbach from Mr. Fritz Stadler. And uh, the price is unknown, but Glenn hints that the price was extremely, extremely high. Freddy was for, awarded the first prize in the 1935 dog show at Basel and also um, received the highest champion certificate on the continent of Europe called the International Beauties Championship Certificate. He also purchased a male named Quelt V. Tiergarten from Mr. G. Walty. He was not the best male in Switzerland as the owner refused to sell the best dog. He writes, on April 21st, 1937, I had a letter from Mrs. Perry B. Rice, secretary of the American Kennel Club, stating that the board of directors held a meeting on Tuesday, April 13, 1937, and it was officially decided to recognize the Bernie's Mountain Dog as a new breed in the working class. These are the first and only dogs of this breed to ever be registered with the American Kennel Club or the Secretary of Agriculture. After this, Shadow went on to write an article for a small magazine in California, um, mainly around San Francisco, called Western Kennel World. And this was written in January of 1938. Um, he discusses the importing of these two dogs, and he mentions that they're the first reported dogs of this breed to land on um, American soil. He mentions that in order to receive them, the dogs left on Sunday morning, November 1st, 1936, and arrived Saturday evening, November 14, 1936. And he says, anyone looking into these dogs' deep brown eyes can see that they have a wonderful understanding and a kind, loving disposition. They are most affectionate towards children and are quite courageous in defending their rights. As a working dog, I have never seen one that I think equals the Bernie's dog. And if the homes that have suffered the loss of children from vicious kidnappers had had one of these dogs as a pet and as a pal for their child, no one would have been able to molest them without first killing the dog. I know it kind of sounds strange. <laughs> At this time in history, you gotta remember what was happening. Lindbergh baby, other things going on. So this is probably where he kind of got his idea to talk a little bit about the kidnapping and stuff. Incidentally, if any of you ever, ever want to be really nice to me, and you see an issue of Western Kennel World from January 1938, I want to pay you highly for it. I cannot find it anywhere. Um, and the only copy that I know of that really truly exists um, is in a library um, in California. And incidentally, there is a woman in Ohio who happens to have the cover in a frame in her basement. She won't sell it to you. <laughs> so, oh well. Um, after this, we're going to talk about an affair to remember. This is where we start talking about the new jumping over the fence. After World War II, breeds and clubs contemplated improving the breed with the introduction of another breed, the Newfoundland. But before a decision can be made, a